Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ron Sanders. I'm the staff director for the Florida Center for Cybersecurity. And um, at the risk of preempting my formal introductions in a few minutes, uh, I'm serving as the principal investigator for this particular grant. Today's program is about that grant. As you can see on the uh, title slide, it is for prospective applicants for subgrant awards funded by the Florida Department of Education to highlight cybersecurity information technology educational pathways. I know that's a mouthful. We'll try to break that down and interpret it for you. But if, uh, if you're in the wrong place, you're welcome to stay. Uh, you just may be bored to tears. If you're in the right place, we're gonna spend about the next hour talking about that grant. We're gonna try to provide details, uh, but I will tell you now that if necessary, this would be the first of several informational webinars to provide applicants like you, potential applicants at least, uh, information about the grant so that you can make a decision. More about that later. Uh, let me start with some brief introductions and then I'll give you an outline of this afternoon's program and then we'll just get into it. All right, so you've already heard about me. Uh, James Welsh, Dr. James Welsh, raise your hand, James, is my co-PI on this project. Uh, not all of you may be familiar with the term principal investigator or co-principal investigator. That's right out of the National Science Foundation. And it basically means if you've got a question or a complaint or a concern, see us. Now, we're not alone in this. We have a team. So let me introduce the team. Uh, Sasha Vanderpool, a newly minted PhD in technical education, is uh, your principal staff point of contact if you've got any questions. Dr. Candy Ring, raise your hand, Candy, is uh, also on the team. She is our educational specialist guru. And we will be adding others to the team. There will be a small, repeat small, grant program office in the Florida Center for Cybersecurity. James, Sasha, uh, Candy, and I will be part of it. There may be one or two more added to oversee the disbursement of that $20 million grant. And before we go any further, let me uh, introduce you to the person who is most responsible, or at least second most responsible for that $20 million grant, Doc, uh, Kathy Hebda. She is not a doctor. She warned us not to call her a doctor, but I still think of her as one anyway. Uh, Kathy is a chancellor with the Florida Department of Education, and she is the co-lead on this project. Uh, Henry Mack, who is the senior chancellor for the Florida Department of Education, uh, is the principal, our, our principal compatriot in crime. I guess I shouldn't say crime, should I? We're gonna do everything by the numbers. But Henry Mack is the senior chancellor. Kathy Hebda is the chancellor. They are in charge of us. They're our adult supervision. And before we go any further, Kathy, uh, I wanted to know if you had any uh, words of wisdom for the group assembled here today. Ron, thank you so much. Um, I am Kathy Hebda, the um, Chancellor of the Florida College System in the Department of Education. And so my role is to work with the 28 community and state colleges across the state. And we are thrilled that uh, Cyber Florida has taken on this responsibility to, to, um, to administer this grant. It's cyber Florida or cybersecurity is such a great need in our state, of course, across the world. Um, but we're worried about Florida. We want to make sure Florida is taken care of. And we want to make sure there's an excellent pipeline into cybersecurity degrees, certificates, programs, and then into cybersecurity jobs and careers in cybersecurity. And so what is unique about this grant and one of the reasons why we're so excited about it is it really does touch all of the different levels of education and works on that pipeline starting from K-12 through our technical colleges and centers, our Florida college system institutions, all the way through our university system. And so we could not be more pleased that, that folks are so interested in this. We're capitalizing, you'll hear more about this, we're capitalizing on the, the depth and breadth of um, cybersecurity programming in the Tampa Bay region, in South Florida, and then also um, spreading that throughout the state. There are other centers and, and points of light throughout the state of Florida that are focused on cybersecurity, um, some well-established, some up and coming, and this is a chance for everybody to work together and really build out that infrastructure so that Floridians in every neighborhood have an opportunity 
to get a great education and, and join a great team out there in the workforce in cybersecurity. So thanks so much, everybody, for joining today. Thank you, Cyber Florida, Ron, and team for everything that you're doing. And we look forward to seeing these results. Kathy, thanks for those good words. And I, and I have to say, it's been great working with you and, and Henry. Uh, that's where the vision comes from, folks. And uh, let me just underscore a couple of points that Kathy made. First, this is pathways plural. There's more than one pipeline. There are lots and lots and lots of cybersecurity jobs. Uh, their conservative estimates put them at 30 to 50,000 in the state alone. I personally believe there are more than that, but there are lots and lots of jobs and there are multiple pathways. It's not just a college degree, but it's a long pathway as well. And, and so uh, the Florida Department of Education has recognized that and they provided grant money for us to explore and uh, test out those pathways. More on, on that later. But again, uh, Kathy, uh, thank you and Henry for your leadership here. Uh, Sasha, Sasha Vanderpool is gonna be controlling the slides this afternoon. And uh, uh, Sasha, let me ask you to go to the next uh, slide. So here are today's ground rules. Uh, we're trying to be as precise as possible. You'll understand why in a little bit. There are lots of federal and state rules that govern here. We're not making those rules up. They're well-established, but they're, they're written in legalese. So we're, we're not gonna take live questions. We are gonna to try to answer every question that you have, but we wanna do that in a reasoned way. So we're gonna research them. You can send them in via the chat uh, box uh, on the Zoom invite, or there's a Q&A icon as well. Uh, Zoom has both. We're not gonna restrict you to one or the other. Uh, Sasha and our team are busy monitoring both. So if you've got questions as we go through, ask them. We're just not gonna do it live because again, we wanna be very precise uh, in our answers, make sure we got all the I's dotted and T's crossed. At the same time, we wanna make sure you have all the information you need to make a decision about whether to apply for a grant and how you do it, okay? Uh, so uh, two ways to get your questions answered. One is to submit them either in the, uh, the, the chat box or the uh, Q&A section on Zoom. Second is to email, email us at cyberflorida.org put pathways in front of it. You saw the email address on the previous slide. And I will tell you now, we're gonna make these slides available both on our website and to everybody on this program. And you should feel free to forward them. They're all public information. So if you've got a question, either ask it now or ask it later. If you ask it later, send it through our, our website and we'll, we'll try to respond within 24, 48 hours. That's if we can track down the experts to do it. You may have experts in your own organization because again, these are well-established federal and state rules. Uh, Dr. Welsh will be covering more of those as we go through, but they are well-established. And for those of you that have long dealt with federal grants or state grants, this is gonna be SOP for you, okay? Uh, uh, as, uh, as Sasha mentioned, we'll provide some more information today about the grant coordinator role but that is separate, repeat separate from the subgrant applications that we're gonna spend most of the time talking about. Uh, two of those grant coordinators have already been designated. Again, more detail later, one at USF and one at Florida International University to correspond to the Tampa Bay area and the greater Miami area. Those are two regions that the Department of Education singled out. The rest of the state is at large. And again, we'll provide you more details about that later. But for, if you've signed up to learn more about being a grant coordinator, stay tuned. We're not gonna give you a lot of information on that. We'll host a separate um, uh, webinar on grant coordinators. So uh, look for that, uh, that invite. Uh, this says that our application and budget templates will be posted tomorrow. We're gonna try to do that by COB today. We assumed that when, the, when we opened the window last Wednesday, nobody had an application ready to submit or a budget they wanted to submit. So we've been making sure that the templates dot all the I's and cross all the T's, they will be posted, they are fillable. So you can just use the templates and hopefully that way you won't have to make anything up. But if you find that there are gaps, again, don't hesitate to ask, uh, ask us questions. I'm gonna add one more um, of my own ground rules. Uh, I've invited James, Candy, Sasha, Kathy, whoever is uh, on our team, if they have a point to make during the course of the webinar, they should just raise their hand and make it. This is not gonna be an hour of lecture. 
trust me. So James may interject while I'm talking. I may do the same while he's talking. Same with Sasha and Candy. All right. So um, uh, team, have I missed anything on ground rules? Nope, sounds good. I see shaking head. So next slide, please, Sasha. All right, this is a little bit of repetition. Um, as Kathy suggested, here's the purpose of the grant. Here's why the governor and the Florida Department of Education has inve have invested $20 million here to identify cybersecurity and information technology pathways, plural, that will produce large numbers of qualified workers to fill cybersecurity and IT jobs in the state and for the nation. We'd like um, all of those workers to stay in the state and fill state jobs in the private sector, the public sector, nonprofits, et cetera. But we also know that this nation it has a huge talent deficit when it comes to cyber and IT. So whether they fill jobs in the state or the nation, the key is to look at existing programs, test them, evaluate them, fund them, stretch them to determine whether uh, in fact they can be adopted statewide, whether they can be scaled, and most importantly, whether they can be sustained. This is a one-year grant, folks. It's a lot of money, but it's just one year. Our hope is that when we make recommendations to the Department of Education and they in turn to the governor and to the state legislature, they will see proven programs that can be scaled and sustained to provide cyber IT pathways for Florida citizens. So that's the purpose. Those are our intended outcomes. So while Kathy and Henry have to worry about the overall purpose of the grant, our outcomes are more precise state adoption, scalability, and sustainability. As an aside, we'd like to propose this as a national model. There are only a handful of states that have gone this way. We think what we're doing is largely unprecedented. So we hope to be able to go to the, the federal government and the US Congress and say, hey, look what we've done here in Florida. It's really cool. You should think about it for national adoption. But here's the bottom line up front. We want your best ideas, ideas that make a difference. Here's a caveat, and again, we'll talk about this a lot as we go through the hour. This is not for a gleam in somebody's eye. This is not for new starts, blank whiteboards. Oh, have I got something I can propose to you? These are not for brilliant ideas that have not already been tested in some form or fashion. These are for existing programs. They don't have to be big. That's what the funds are for, to expand them and test whether they can be adopted and scaled and sustained. But they are for existing programs, not something that somebody's just thought of. Again, team, have I missed anything? And I'm not going to ask that question again. If I miss something, you should just interject. Okay, Sasha, next slide, please. All right, Dr. Welsh, over to you. Yes, thank you, Ron. One of the uh, areas that we'll be talking about today is what kinds of uh, programs and projects are eligible for funding under this, uh, under this grant program. Um, we won't talk about um, whether or not something is um, uh, a, a, a good match, anything that sort of qualifies um, the proposals. We'll talk about allowable costs versus non-allowable costs and things that are consistent with this funding stream that are eligible for funding under this under this funding stream, but whether or not uh, it is a good match for the purpose of this grant is the case that you're going to make in your proposals. And we'll talk more about that uh, on a later slide. Um, we have um, three different application areas. And when you submit your application uh, on the website, you'll choose to submit it under one of these three areas. Um, region one is uh, the greater Tampa Bay area. That includes um, Sarasota, Polk, Pasco, Hernando, Pinellas, Manatee, and Hillsborough. And Region 2 is the greater Miami area. That includes Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach. Um, and then we have uh, a third uh, category that's at large. Um, those are submissions coming from all other areas of Florida. Um, these, um, the first two designations were part of what the state determined um, in, in setting up the grant uh, application. The third is a distinction that Cyber Florida arrived at um, in collaboration with the state. 
uh, figuring out how best to handle um, the, the rest of the application, the rest of the areas of the state. Um, the two, um, Region 1 and Region 2, are areas that uh, both have um, state universities with um, CAE, CD designation. Um, and they are the greatest concentration of um, uh, K-12 students and the greatest concentration of cybersecurity jobs uh, in the state. Um, not to say that uh, other areas of the state aren't uh, equally important, um, but to, to sort of scale programs across uh, different areas. And, and the other reason, of course, to encourage partnerships among regions, uh, because we know that partnerships between different educational organizations, between different parts of the pipeline are uh, a desirable outcome for the overall project. So James, I'm gonna model my own ground rule and interject uh, two things. James alluded to this. Uh, first, the Department of Education told us uh, you will focus at least two target areas, one in the Tampa Bay area, one in the greater Miami area. Those are more precisely defined in the DOE grant, and we're going to post that grant so you can see the counties that are actually covered. But as James summarized them, those are specifically identified by the Department of Education. They left it up to us as to whether or not we'd offer a third region or whether we create an at-large category. And um, while the first two regions uh, cover more than half of the students in the, the state, uh, th when the, the, the next largest geographic area is literally about half uh, one of the first two. So we decided we would look at uh, the rest of the state as one big conglomeration and at-large category. Uh, James mentioned the, re the grant coordinators. Here's what CAECD stands for. Uh, the, Nas the National Security Agency and the Department of Homeland Security have what, are, what amount to accreditation standards for cyber curricula. And they have designated seven schools in the state as Centers for Academic Excellence, that's a CAE, Cyber Defense, CAECD. Those are the schools that provide degree programs that meet NSA and DHS standards. In the Tampa region, there's only one school that meets those standards, that's USF. Some of you may be saying, well, uh, Cyber Florida is also in USF. Yes, but we are firewalled. We've made sure that all conflict of interest rules apply and we're going to follow them to the letter. So we have firewalled the Center for Cybersecurity, which is the grant recipient, from USF's role as a grant coordinator, but USF was chosen as a grant coordinator because they have that designation. Florida International is the only school in the greater Miami area that has the CAECD designation. And as James said, in collaboration with the state, we have designated the other five schools, and you know who you are, we've actually sent you a letter one of them, all of them can nominate somebody to serve as that third at-large grant coordinator. And we've left it up to them to propose whether they're our employee or their employee. Again, that's probably more detailed than you need, except to say, bottom line, we'll have a separate session for grant coordinators. If you are one of those CAECD SUS institutions, boy, is that a lot of acronyms. Um, You'll, you'll be invited uh, to that separate webinar, but that's the reason why USF and FIU are already designated as grant coordinators and a third SUS institution to be determined will be designated as the third grant coordinator. And we'll talk a little bit more about their roles later. Sorry to interrupt James, but- Not um, at all. The only other thing- the only other thing to mention about the grant coordinators is those grant coordination offices, and this is probably, you probably understood this already, the grant coordination offices are firewalled off from, from other in offices at those institutions that might apply for funding under this uh, program. Um, so we expect that we'll see applications from all of the state universities, including USF and FIU. The grant coordination offices will be separate from the entities that are applying for those uh, grants. That's a great point. And let me just underscore it because that would allow. So let's take USF as an example. 
The Florida Center for Cybersecurity is located at USF. We are firewalled from that part of USF that will uh, be designated as the grant coordination office. But they in turn, as are we, firewalled from anybody at USF or in the Tampa Bay area who wants to apply for a grant. Again, we are going to follow religiously all conflict of interest rules. Same applies to FIU. FIU is a grant coordinator. That doesn't stop somebody else from FIU from applying for a grant. So long as the conflict of interest rules are religiously followed. And if you're planning on doing that, you should speak to that in your application. Sorry, James, go ahead. No, that's all right. I think we're good on this and ready for the next slide, Sasha. Great, and I think that's my, my turn. So here's the timeline and let me, let me describe very briefly what the rest of the afternoon is gonna look like. Uh, you've already been through introductions. James and I are gonna walk through a number of procedural issues. Um, and you'll see slides that um, uh, are, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just reading something that's on the, the chat. Uh, you'll see slides that deal with, the, um, with those procedural issues. So part one is introduction, part two are a bunch of slides, death by PowerPoint. Uh, towards the end of that presentation, James is gonna respond to Q&A. These, again, we're not gonna respond live. These are among the several dozen questions that have already been submitted and we've kind of bucketed them, grouped them so that we can deal with them more generally. James will address those as a third part of the program, and then we'll close with next steps. Uh, and hopefully that'll use up uh, most of the hour. Uh, sorry to interrupt, James. Uh, here's the timeline. Uh, as we said at the outset, we're asking you to submit a non-binding, underscore that word, non-binding intent to apply. The reason it's not binding is because we're not gonna hold you to it, but we are trying to get some sense of how big a workload we're going to have in sorting through applications. Is it two or three big ones or is it 20 or 30 small ones or is it something in between? My advice to you, if you're even thinking about applying, give us notice of intent. Again, it's non-binding. If you later say, oh, not for us, we're not eligible, too big a bite, nothing, we don't have anything that's existing, whatever it is, you can withdraw. We'd rather have fewer than the notices of intent than to be surprised by more. So send us the notice of intent by the 23rd of March. We opened the application window last week. We're giving you approximately 30 days to do it. So it was open on the 9th of March. It'll close on the 17th of April. It's about five weeks actually. Um, so that's the window. Uh, and uh, again, we'll hold several of these informational webinars if you ask us to, to provide more information as you actually get into the application process, it's only a week open and uh, you, may, you, you may have more questions uh, as we go through it as the, as the um, open window proceeds. So uh, stay tuned, but that's the uh, approximately five weeks worth of application window uh, for you to submit something. Uh, we're gonna try to limit our ability to review those to two or three weeks. And again, that will depend a lot on how many applications we get, but we're, uh, we're targeting mid-May as, uh, as our um, uh, target for announcing winners and providing feedback to those whose applications aren't accepted. Our intention is to give you the money before people leave the 2021-2022 uh, school year into May, early June. So that's our target. Again, we're hedging on that because we don't know how many are going to apply. But our, our objective, our goal, is to have subawards announced by mid-May, funds distributed by the end of May and early June. That gives you a, at least one full uh, school year from one June to 15 August, 2023, to implement your project. And again, these are supposed to be existing projects, not new starts. So hopefully we're going to be adding funding to something that is already in motion. You'll owe us a final evaluative report of your project on or about 15 August. We will compile all of those and we owe the Department of Education a final summative report that recommends, um, you know, here are the things that worked, here are the things that didn't, here's what we recommend in terms of sustainability by the end of September and more details to come as we go throughout the year. 
Uh, uh, over to you, James, for uh, what's next. Let's just back up one second um, on this. I want to mention on the intent to apply that we don't need a whole lot of detail. Right. Uh, we, we don't want you to spend a whole lot of time crafting an intent to reply. Um, focus on your proposal. Just, just let us, give us a heads up. Let us know. That's a, just a simple email. The other is um, that um, just to reiterate the dates, the September 30th date is just there for informational purposes. All of your stuff will be to us before that. That's again, September 30th, 2023. Um, so this is not strictly limited to any academic year necessarily, but your final reports will be due to us by the 15th of August. So that's really the date to focus on um, for the end. But but you know, good good to let you know. We're trying to be as transparent as possible with all of the all of the activities that we have. Uh, next slide. Um, so the entities that are eligible to uh, apply for the grant funding are Florida public school districts, post-secondary career and uh, technical centers, charter technical career centers, Florida college system institutions, Florida state university system institutions, and any combination of the above. Can it be a single institution? Yes, it can, that's allowable. Although partnerships are part of what we're looking for in the applications, it is allowable for uh, a single institution to apply for the funds. Um, can uh, others participate in the grants that are not, uh, others that are not, don't fit one of these definitions? Yes, but the application needs to be led by one of these, uh, somebody who fits into one of these categories. Um, we know that uh, um, public-private partnerships are vital to um, cybersecurity education. And so um, we, we do, do nothing to discourage uh, partnerships with uh, private companies, nonprofit organizations, um, any other outside entities. Um, the, the, the applicant who is signing the application, who is, who is applying for this, who is leading the effort, uh, needs to fit into one of these categories. But the partnerships can be broad and inclusive of lots of different kinds of entities. Next slide. Um, so some examples of activities and examples of outcomes, um, and these come from the call for applications, um, the kinds of things that, that we wanna fund. You know, one of the things is this, this funding stream is largely unprecedented. We're doing something here that uh, other states have have not done. Um, it's a it's a leading program in the country, and so um, it's not a a narrow call. We're not telling you you must uh, increase uh, certifications or you have to approach it in one certain way. There are a lot of parts to this, and a lot of different ways you might approach it. Um, so in each case, these things that I'll list off are uh, it's inclusive of these things, but not limited to. We want your best ideas for how to address this problem. Um, so the kinds of things that are, the kinds of activities uh, that are included in this are integrated education and training of elementary, middle, high school, college, uh, and working adult students uh, via courses and curriculum. Um, and, and, and James, let me add, there's an and or there. Be, be, be cognizant of the conjunction. It could be one, two, three, all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, secondary CTE courses or programs, uh, non-credit training that includes preparation for industry certifications, and that's broadly interpreted. We had some questions come in about can we um, can we do things that will help students get industry certifications? Yeah, that's consistent with this funding stream. Can we do things that will help teachers get industry certifications? Yes. That's inclusive of, of these kinds of descriptions. Um, registered registered pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs, training programs for existing workers and or upskilling those in other industries. Um, and other industries uh, should be broadly interpreted. The, the, the work that's happening here is not exclusive to cybersecurity or IT industries. It could be uh, um, other, other, uh, other sectors of the of the uh, um, public uh, economy that where cybersecurity and IT jobs touch those those industries. So I'm, I'm saying specifically if it were uh, we had a question specifically about um, uh, things like agriculture, um, if it's for cybersecurity and IT pathways that lead to a specific career in agriculture, is that included? Yes, it is. Um, and uh, teacher education and professional development. 
some of the possible program outcomes. When you um, submit your application, there are just a few questions that you'll go through in the form, and then you'll upload a PDF of your application, your proposal. Um, one of those questions will ask you to categorize the outcomes from your uh, uh, proposal. Um, and uh, the, the outcomes that are possible, and it's, it's not an exhaustive list, the, the last one is other possible outcomes, uh, but you might categorize your outcomes as student outcomes. Uh, and examples of student outcomes might be increased enrollment in cybersecurity courses or programs, or increased completion of industry certs, um, programmatic or institutional outcomes is the second big category, and that might include such things as improvement to existing curriculum frameworks or the development of model articulation agreements. Um, the third big category is workforce outcomes, uh, such as uh, delivery of educational and training programs that integrate employer involvement or that support hands-on learning opportunities. Um, and that fourth sort of catch-all, other outcomes, uh, that may be proposed by the applicants. That's um, meant to catch those ideas that we haven't anticipated, possible program outcomes that will impact the purpose uh, of this funding stream that, that we haven't conceived of. You may have an idea that is truly innovative, something that you are working on now that you've seen a great promise with and you're ready to scale it up and it doesn't really fit into any of those categories. Uh, or perhaps it's those categories and the, the other that you that you have there. But those are some examples of activities and outcomes. Again, not a limited list, but um, uh, um, the, the ones that we've thought of that, that we can suggest to you. Next slide, please. Thanks, James. Um, I, I think this one is mine. Uh, Sasha, next slide, please. There you go. Uh, let me just underscore a couple of things that James said, and, and we've already got somebody commenting on this in the chat room, so I'll take the liberty of responding. These need to be built on something. They need to be existing. Does that mean that you're simply asking for money to expand it? Not necessarily, but there needs to be a there there, something that you've already done, a class, a, um, uh, a curriculum, a program, something that already exists and your fund, the, the, the funds we give you are intended to expand it, make it more amenable to state adoption, sustainability, scalability, whatever it is. But uh, with all due respect, folks, there's just not enough money, nor is there enough time to start something from scratch. Uh, Kathy uh, Hepta has a comment. Kathy, go ahead, please. Thanks. I just wanted to comment on what you're talking about, Ron, because it, there are, while we are calling for new ideas and, and, and ways to expand cybersecurity, there is the element of time and, and because of the source of these funds, which is the governor's discretionary um, federal grants um, under the uh, Relief Act, Emergency Relief Act, there is a time limit on them. And so uh, one of the opportunities you could have is if there is already something happening at your, at your secondary school and you want to create a better pathway to the post-secondary institution in your area or vice versa, um, those are the kinds of things we are hoping for in this area, bringing in new business partners um, or taking an existing business partnership and expanding it to additional grade levels or optional cert certifications that can be achieved. Um, there are lots and lots of things that could be done here based on what folks are already doing. And uh, so I just wanted to, to mention those things as, as, um, as those would still be new and innovative at the same time as they build on something that does currently exist in your area. Great, Kathy, Great. thank you very much. That, uh, as we've all said, there needs to be a there there. It can't just be a gleam in somebody's eye. It's easy to ask for money for that. So um, hopefully you've got something that you started and the funds from the subgrant will expand on it. As James said, we're casting a wide, wide net. We don't wanna exclude anything. The examples he gave you are just that what we're going to ask you to do is make the case in your application. Here's how what we propose contributes to the purpose of the grant. <laughs> to, to state it simply, more cybersecurity and IT workers for the state and the nation. Here's how our, our application contributes to that. And here's how it also contributes to the outcomes that Cyber Florida, Florida Center for Cybersecurity, is obligated to achieve. Uh, a statewide adoption, scalability, sustainability. You have to make the case, as James suggested, and we'll belabor this point throughout. 
We're not going to comment on the merits. We're going to give you all the examples we can think of, but we don't have a monopoly on good ideas. As, as Kathy has said, there just needs to be a there there, but you're free to propose just about anything. We're not going to comment on the merits. That's what the review will do. Here are some other expectations. As, I, as we talked about, we're, we will have grant coordinators, one for Tampa, uh, the Tampa area, one for the Miami area, one at large. They are, and uh, we'll have a separate webinar for them. For those of you that apply, know that they're gonna be honest brokers, interlocutors, your champions, your advocates, but also uh, evaluators. They'll be troubleshooting. We are deliberately setting up these grant coordinators so that they are a bridge between you and us. Because ultimately we've got to make a call on what is sustainable. But the grant coordinators are there for you. They're there for us too. We're going to put them squarely in the middle. And they know that coming in. You also, uh, you, we also expect you to collect data. Uh, we're going to ask you in your application to provide performance metrics, what you propose. But we're also going to ask you to give us a data collection plan. How do you propose to tell us whether you're achieving those metrics? How will you know if you succeed? That goes to the evaluation part. So again, you should plan on that. My hope is, our hope is that you're already doing that, that this is nothing new. Same thing with progress reports. We all report to somebody. And um, if we give you money, we'll expect periodic progress reports, most likely through the grant coordinators. And again, they're there to help you. They're not there to, um, as inspectors general. They're there to troubleshoot, to help, to help you get resources, to help you make connections. Uh, and um, as a result, we're gonna to ask, to ask you to share information. Uh, if you need help, ask before you need it. It's better to ask before you need it than after things are about ready to go belly up. So uh, one, of your, one of our expectations of you, if you're uh, a winner, is to ask for assistance if you need it. And if there's one sort of overarching expectation, we wanna do this collaboratively. Yes, we're gonna make this formal, uh, when it comes to actually reviewing applications and announcing winners. But once the winners are announced, we're going to go into collaboration mode. We want you to succeed. Uh, James is going to talk a little bit more later about what that may or may not mean, but we want you to succeed. And we're going to do everything we can to help you. At the end of the day, when, the, when your part of the grant ends and we have to make recommendations, that's when we'll go back into formal mode again but between uh, announcement of the winners and the, uh, the closeout of your implementation period, uh, we want to help you. We're going to do everything we can to help you succeed. But if you don't succeed, that's OK, too. And James will explain more about that in a minute. So of the $20 million grant, we expect that 17 million will be available for awards. We'll make every dime available for awards to programs as is possible. We expect that to be about 17 million, but it could be it could be more than that. Um, approximately a third will go to uh, projects from the Tampa Bay region, approximately a third to projects from the Miami region, and approximately a third dedicated to uh, statewide uh, projects. Um, the size of the awards is a big question, right? Like it, usually you expect in a grant program, how much can I ask for? Um, this is a new program uh, and we are looking for uh, the best ideas across the state. Um, it's, it's difficult to um, uh, say what size those applications should be. So what we can tell you is that your, the, the budget that you're asking for should be commensurate with the outcomes that you are proposing. Um, it, is it possible that you could ask for all 17 million? Um, it's, it's not prohibited, but you would have to make one heck of a case that no other funds should go to any other projects. The, the outcomes that you're proposing would have to be um, uh, pretty, pretty wild. Uh, so, um, Make sure that the project that you're the project outcomes that you're targeting uh, are commensurate with uh, the budget that you're asking for. No more, no less. Um, the the number of awards will be determined based on that as well. And again, we're looking at uh, across the state the impact that we can have uh, with the overall program, and we're trying to balance all of that out as part of the uh, as part of the choice of the programs. 
uh, to fund. Um, allowable expenses are governed by federal and state rules, existing federal and state rules. Um, so any guidance that you have internally in your institution to what kinds of expenses are allowable or not, or not allowable apply here. Uh, but we'll have specific language in the FAQ section uh, on the website. And I'll give you some specific examples based on questions that were submitted uh, in just a moment. Um, so the questions that we've received so far um, have fit into a, a couple of different categories. Um, one is about eligibility of programs, sort of the broad categories of questions that we received, eligibility of programs, allowable, not allowable expenses, um, how we're determining merits of programs, questions about the regional coordinator and that role, and questions about performance of programs. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these now. Um, as far as eligibility of programs, things like uh, is my project sort of fill in the blank, blank eligible for funding under this grant? Broadly, the question is um, uh, answered in this way. Your program is eligible if it is submitted by an eligible organization, first of all, and if it addresses the purpose of the grant. Um, the purpose of the grant to increase the quantity and quality of skilled cybersecurity and IT workers for the state and the nation. Um, and the quality of your proposal is, uh, is going to be judged on how well you make that argument, that your proposed activities um, match that, that purpose. So is your program eligible? Yes, um, provided that it meets those two criteria. Um, so some specific examples, uh, can I train a pro or can I propose a program that trains teachers? Yes. K-12 students? Yes. State college students, university students, adults that are outside of the formal education system? Yes. All of those uh, kinds of activities fit under the example activities that we talked about before. Um, another uh, example of a question that we received, um, um, my team is considering only applying to expand information technology pathways. Is that acceptable or do we need to include cybersecurity? Um, that's an and or. And so yes, um, something that addresses only cybersecurity or only IT pathways um, would be uh, eligible for, for funding. Um, and again, not talking about the merits, just talking about whether or not it is eligible under, under the criteria that we have established. Um, there, we had a question about would a statewide proposal fit in the at-large at applicant pool? Um, we're uh, recommending that if you are uh, proposing from an institution in the Tampa Bay area that you propose under region one, if you're proposing from an institution in the Miami area that you pro propose under region two and elsewhere in the state you're proposing the at-large uh, region. Um, your ability to work um, the ability of your proposal to scale statewide um, is something that we're looking for in the descriptions of, of your program. Um, so that's, uh, that's something that would be encouraged. Um, would the addition, here's that other question that I referred to before, would the addition of a cybersecurity course to a health science, agriculture, or other pathway program be considered uh, as a programmatic outcome. Yes, um, that, that is consistent with uh, this, this program. Um, so, um, and, and we'll, we'll move on to the, to the next category of questions. These are some of the specific questions we received that fit in this category and the general guidance that we have on this category. And again, the, the FAQ section that we post will have uh, more detailed responses. And if you find that your question hasn't been addressed adequately in this way, please uh, submit uh, a question to us um, in the chat here or through the, the email, and we'll we'll do our best to give you very specific guidance on that. Um, Ron, okay. did you have any thoughts on this? Yeah. Yeah, uh, just very quickly. Again, this is probably belaboring the point, but maybe one worth uh, belaboring. Um, uh, again, existing programs. How does your proposal contribute to the goal of the grant and the outcomes that both we have to uh, meet? as well as the outcomes you propose. It's like a hypothesis. This is what we think. This is, and, and make your case. Uh, just saying it with all due respect, just saying it is probably not sufficient. You're gonna have to prove that our, your hypothesis, that if you give us money, this will happen. You're gonna have to prove that. Make your case. 
that's what the that's what the application is for. That's what we'll be looking for when we uh, review the applications. Again, those eligible organizations, we gave the categories of those before. There's no preference between those eligible organizations. There's not a, for instance, a preference for SUS institutions as lead organizations over um, any other category of institution as a lead organization. You need a lead organization, it needs to be one of those, um, but there's, there's not a preference between them. Um, so this question about uh, sort of question category about allowable or not allowable expenses, federal and state definitions apply for allowable and non-allowable will link to the specific rules uh, of this uh, funding stream, um, which are very standard. It's very standard language, but we'll link to that from the FAQs and we'll respond to specific questions. Some of the questions that we've seen um, and some of these questions are kind of borderline where you know, you're asking a question that may be asking, is this an appropriate use of this funding stream as a purpose for my grant, my outcomes, and you may be asking, is this an allowable expense? Um, so things like, um, um, let's see here, can this grant pay for um, personnel, for instance? Some, we had a, the question, can we use this to pay for a teacher? Can we use this to pay for an outside expert to work with us? Um, that doesn't work for um, one of the one of the allowable eligible organizations. The answer is yes uh, to both of those, and that the allowable non allowable rules for expenses apply. So as long as it's within those rules, yes, um, those uh, different kinds of things. Can the grant pay for equipment? Um, we we're asked about upgrading equipment uh, in lab environments. Yes, um, uh, equipment is allowable under the rules, but I'd refer you to those rules specifically on, on what you're able to purchase. Another uh, way that that question was phrased is, um, can we uh, revamp a, a classroom for this purpose? Well, that's a little bit more complicated. Can, can you buy computers? Yes. Um, can you buy uh, furniture? No. Furniture is not an allowable expense uh, under, under this funding stream. Um, so I refer you to those rules on allowable and unallowable, uh, not allowable, and and the experts within your own organization, but we are happy to uh, um, get responses from, get interpretations of it from experts within our organization uh, to make sure uh, we get you an adequate answer to your question. James, let me just add, we, we clearly have some experts on the line. That's right. Because they're even citing forms that I've never heard of. Uh, the, the point is, you if you've ever applied for a state or federal grant, and, and frankly, uh, our expectation is that almost every eligible organization has probably done that. Then there's probably somebody in your organization that knows about this and can answer some of your questions. Having said that, as James suggested, we're gonna try to answer every question that we can, but let, let us both emphasize, we're not making this stuff up. These are existing federal and state rules, what is allowable and what's not. So unfortunately, uh, even though our staff has worked on a fancy logo for cyber IT pathways, uh, I'm not allowed to buy t-shirts or lapel pins that have that fancy logo. That is not an allowable expense under the uh, state and federal rules. So unfortunately, we can't do that. I want to add one other point here about indirect costs. Um, and, and that's there with specific language on, on indirect cost rate. And I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to give you some text verbatim, and it'll it'll be part of the the piece. But I don't want to um, add any layers of interpretation that might um, that might complicate things. This is a, a grant from the the Florida Department of Education um, to Cyber Florida USF, and it's uh, it involves federal funds. Um, you're applying to for a sub award to that grant. Um, all subawards are, are subject to the same guidance um, as the original grant on indirect cost. So um, uh, FDOE will allow uh, other state agencies, state universities and state colleges to charge an indirect, uh, which is administrative and or overhead of up to 5% uh, or the recipient's rate approved by the appropriate cognizant, cognizant agency, whichever is lower. Um, the rate, this rate may be charged on total direct costs dispersed, less the amounts of subcontracts in excess of $25,000 uh, and for items 
of equipment, alterations, renovations, and flow through funds on programs issued by the department. Um, there's uh, a little bit more specifics there um, about what's included and not included. The general, that general guideline, there's 5% uh, indirect as a limit in this grant proposal. Um, and there are some specifics about what it applies to or, or doesn't apply to. We'll give you the exact language that we're referring to um, for, this, for this project. Um, if you have questions based on uh, the guidance that we give you, we're happy to get those answers for you and, uh, and provide those, or any guidance that you have from, from experts on indirect costs and grant costing within your organizations. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so there's also a general category of questions about the merit of the program. Is this a good project um, for this uh, grant? And that's determined by the review process based on your proposal. Um, so we'll look at your proposal. We'll look for the match between uh, the purpose of this grant funding and what you're proposing in your, in your proposal, the quality of your proposal, the quality of your team. And we'll put an emphasis on the cost effectiveness of your proposal, the likelihood to contribute to the project purpose, the partnerships, and really sustainability and scalability are key to the things that we're, we're looking for there. Um, so, you know, and as we've said, we can't really answer questions of, is this a good match? Is this a, am I, is my proposal good for this program? Um, we can tell you whether it's eligible or not. We can't really tell you whether it's a good match. That's your case to make um, in your proposal. Um, next slide, please. So um, we had a, a few questions about um, sort of what happens if we don't achieve. Um, are there penalties if we fail to achieve our outcomes uh, built into this, this grant program? And, and I, I want to make a distinction here between non-performance and not achieving desired outcomes. Um, the non-performance question, did you say, do what you said you were going to do? Um, that's the non-performance question. And if there's a non-performance issue, we don't expect that, but if there is any issue with non-performance, um, there are a, a standard array of options uh, that exist for state grants um, uh, and for federal grants that, that allow uh, for, for addressing non-performance. Um, but uh, not achieving desired outcomes is not the same thing. And so we recognize that um, you're going to um, uh, propose activities that you expect to lead to outcomes. If you do the activities that you proposed and, and they don't lead to the outcomes that you expected, um, we can learn from that. And that's, um, that's a, a possible uh, outcome for your, for your project uh, that, we're, that we're, there, there are no penalties uh, attached to that uh, in particular. Ron, did you want to elaborate on that? Um, I, yeah, I can uh, very briefly, but only again to underscore the point uh, that you just made. Uh, you've got to make your case. It is a hypothesis. And look, we all know this. Hypotheses don't always come true. The purpose of the funding is to take what may already exist, uh, even in rudimentary form, and expand it, scale it, build it out. Uh, with the hypothesis being that if you do, you'll achieve the outcomes that you propose that we are obliged to meet and that the uh, grant is intended to, to achieve. But that is an hypothesis. We will learn from our mistakes. We don't want to foreclose learning. Uh, my bet is that everybody on this uh, webinar is an educator of one sort or another, and you all know the value of failure to learn. That's different than non-performance. You just screwed it up. You bought t-shirts or you bought chairs. You can't do that. That's an issue, that's an example of non-performance. Or if you said, we're gonna hire five people and you don't hire anybody and you use the money to go to Rio de Janeiro, that's non-performance. That's not the same as saying, we think that if we put money to this, we'll expand the pipeline of IT workers or cyber workers and we fund it. And if that does not prove to be true, that's okay. We have learned. So, but this is the difference between failure and learning, if that makes sense. Next slide, please, Sasha. So the grant coordinators, um, uh, as we've said, I think we've probably covered all of this. The, the Region 1 coordinator office will be at USF, Region 2 at FIU, and the at-large um, is to be determined. Um, and uh, we've talked about why the grant coordinator offices were placed at, at those locations. 
Um, once the, the projects are, are named and, and things get underway, those grant coordinators um, are, their, their primary role is to be your point of contact and help you be as successful as possible. Um, they're, they're not there to be um, your overseers. This is a, a grant and, and once, once granted, it's your project to run. Uh, but those grant coordinators are there to um, uh, look out for you, advocate for you, and advise you on ways that you might be more successful. Um, they're going to look at all of the projects under their purview, and they might um, identify uh, connections between uh, projects or um, have advice for you based on the experience of other projects in your uh, in your area. Um, but those those grant coordinators are your advocates, your cheerleaders, um, and your, your point of contact. Um, and they, they want you to be successful just as all of us at Cyber Florida want you to be successful in this. Um, we wanna help you have a successful application experience and we wanna help those who are selected to, to move forward to have a, a successful execution period. Um, we're excited about um, the, all of the possibilities uh, that this grant funding can have uh, to transform cybersecurity education in the state of Florida and place Florida as a national leader in cybersecurity education. And, and James, I, I need to add when it comes to grant coordinators, I screwed up. Uh, as somebody has already pointed out, uh, we are limiting consideration for grant coordinators to those schools that have been designated by the National Security Agency and the Department of Homeland Security as centers for academic excellence in cyber defense education. I said cyber defense, I've dropped the E, it's cyber defense education. There are other designations for research and for operations, but the key here is education. This is an educational pathways grant. So only those SUS institutions that have been designated by the NSA and the Department of Homeland Security as meeting the standards for becoming a center for academic excellence in cyber defense education, CDE, not just CD, CDE are eligible to be grant coordinators. My apologies for screwing up. Uh, that was only, uh, 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 the, the only error was in the language in this call, the, the, the execution of it is, is correct and, and we have the right uh, institutions uh, in that process. Great, thank you. Um, and, and that is all and we have, uh, we've, We've stayed under an hour with, with, our, with our presentation. Barely under an hour. I'm showing about 58 minutes. Uh, and uh, I, I get to do next steps. Um, I'm not going to repeat what's in on the website in terms of uh, applying uh, for the grants. We hope a lot of you apply. Send us your notice of intent. Again, that's not binding. We just want to get a sense for how big a workload we're going to have in reviewing these. But here's the bottom line. We said this at the beginning, I'll repeat it at the end. This is really cool stuff. This is new, it's unprecedented. And yes, while we're asking you to build on existing programs, it's largely because we just don't have time for new starts. We've got a year to make our case, for you to make your case to us, for us to make our case collectively to the state and potentially the nation so that we can build these pathways and sustain them. This is all about filling all of those cybersecurity jobs in the state and in the nation, but there's also a national security imperative here. All you gotta do is look at the headlines and the fears that we all have about somebody, potentially the Russians, potentially their proxies or somebody else hacking our back account or um, our lesson plan or our intellectual property. Cybersecurity is a national security imperative. It's important. And what we're doing with these grants and what you're doing on the ground and on the front lines is really, really important. And that's why we're trying to make the $20 million as much of it as possible available uh, to you to build these out. Uh, James, any final words from you? No, just uh, thank you so much for your interest in, in the grant program. We're so excited to get started on this project and we're excited to see what, where we are one year from now as we're, uh, as we're, as we're wrapping up uh, all of the implementation of this. Uh, it's it's a, an exciting time to be working on these, on these very important problems. Thank you. Great, thanks, James. Uh, so look, I'm gonna sign us off. Send us your questions, we'll respond. 
send us your notice of intent, send us your applications. And just to underscore the point here, um, uh, our, my boss, Mike McConnell, uh, former director of NSA and director of national intelligence, is very close personal friends with the nation's new national cyber director, NCD, Chris Inglis. Uh, Chris is a good friend of mine as well. They are all watching us. They want to see what we can do. So here's our chance and here's our opportunity. Go forth. Let's let's uh, let's do great things here. Thanks, everybody. Look for more webinars and uh, and we'll look for your applications.